Welcome to the easier way to sell presentation of Close the Deal Without Selling. Here's your host and developer of the easier way to sell, Ike Krieger. Hey, this is Ike Krieger. Welcome back. All right, this is the moment many of you have been waiting for. We're going to go through the entire quick system. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a challenge sharing that much information with you in a short podcast. So let's devote the next four episodes to a step-by-step -step analysis of the entire YES formula process. You're even going to get to use the diagnostic questions you've memorized. I want you to listen to these podcasts. Take notes. Listen again. Take more notes. Or use your action guide, which will speed up your learning and retention process. Practice. Practice by yourself. Practice with the recorder on your phone. Practice with friends. Practice with family members. Practice. Add doing to your learning. Remember, you have to tune 100 pianos before you become a confident and efficient piano tuner. It doesn't matter where you tune your 100 pianos. You just have to tune them. The reason prospects treat salespeople with disrespect is because salespeople haven't told them it's not allowed. That's right. You need to set up some guidelines for the communication. You need to establish some rules. If the prospect agrees to follow these rules, we'll do our part in solving their problem, but they have to agree to do their part. Their part in this communication is to answer your questions as honestly and candidly as possible. Now, you might ask, why would prospects be interested in following some rules that a salesperson sets up? They'd be willing to follow your rules if they really believe that what you're there for, either in person or on the telephone, is to solve their problem and not yours. You may be wondering, what kind of rules is this guy talking about? You might be saying, there are no rules in sales. It's more or less a free-for-all. However, I believe that consumers have their rules and salespeople have rules of their own. If this weren't true, why would consumers feel that they must defend themselves against salespeople by offering limited or inaccurate information? I say, let's set up the same rules for both parties. Let's define a set of rules for the communication that both sides can agree to. Well, I searched, but I couldn't find a set of rules for this type of non-adversarial sales communication. So, I made up a set of rules. And this rule-setting process is part of the YES formula. You get to establish these rules the same way you did when you were a child. You and your friends agreed to make a fire hydrant serve as third base. Or you could make a card table and a blanket serve as a fort or a castle. As I mentioned earlier, the best example of setting up rules is in the game of Monopoly. If I set up a Monopoly board between us, we couldn't start playing until we found out what rules everyone used when we were children. Sure, there are rules inside the box cover, but you made up your own when you were a kid. I don't know how much money you put in free parking. I don't know how you get out of jail, and I certainly don't know what rules you used to mortgage a property. You established rules among the players and that made the game fair for all parties. I call these rules as they apply to the sales game, mutually beneficial agreements. And I suggest you set up mutually beneficial agreements for mutually beneficial reasons. You want to be spending your time with people that are ready, willing, and able to buy and want to buy from you. If the prospect is unsure, or is truly a no about playing by your rules, shake hands and move on. Now, 
it's time for those rules. Okay, let's get started on a review of the entire YES formula, the easier way to sell. First of all, success with the YES formula is not an outcome. Success with the YES formula is a process. And in this system, the first step in this process is to establish rapport and relationship with your prospect. This rapport and relationship will help you create an environment where the questions that I keep telling you to ask will be answered honestly. And in some cases, rapport will happen naturally over time through repetitive calls, contacts, networking, or on a golf course. Your focus is on creating rapport and relationship. And in future episodes, you'll discover how to enhance rapport almost immediately. And by immediately, I'm talking about 60 seconds to three minutes. Now, once the environment has been established, it's time to begin the sales process using the YES formula. Our sales process is known as QUICK. QUICK is nothing more than a formula for effective communication that just happens to work in the selling process. QUICK is an agreement-based process. Every step of the way, you test for an agreement to move forward. You'll ask questions like, is that okay, or do you mind if we X, or is that something you'd be willing to do? These type of questions allow the client to open the door to a next step on their own without being bullied or forced. If they're not ready to move forward, they'll usually tell you. With the yes formula, you get to tell the prospect that you're going to use it. You get to tell the prospect how it works, and you get permission from the prospect to use it. Basically, you tell them that you're going to use Quick, then you use Quick, and finally you share with the prospect the information that Quick has uncovered, and then you ask if your assessment of that information is accurate. This approach is based on the public speaking model. Avoid giving a traditional presentation. You know, in some instances, a traditional presentation may actually signify to a prospect that you're in a please buy from me and here's why mode. Now, you may not be in that mode at all when you sell, but that doesn't mean you're not viewed that way. So in this review of the S yes formula, I'd like you to look for a presentation. And if you hear one, distinguish who's giving that presentation. Spot if and where objections appear, and most of all, listen for the signs of control. Identify who appears to hold control of the communication throughout the process. For learning purposes, you'll hear me selling a generic product, a, a widget. It doesn't matter what product you're marketing, selling, or promoting. The YES formula is the easier way to sell. This system is a communications model that works in all aspects of your life. And right now, we're focusing on the business uses rather than the personal value of the system. You'll find that bringing the YES formula model into other areas of your life will work just as effectively. Those of you committed to learn this system, allow me to repeat a couple of quotes from earlier episodes. For those things we have to learn before we do them, we learn by doing them. That's Aristotle. You have to tune a hundred pianos. That's Bob Perkins. Hey, this is Ike. This is one of those inserts where I'm coming to you from the future. Uh, we're at episode 41, and we were just talking about the prelude, and I have made an adjustment over the past year, and I'm going to share it with you now. And it has to do with taking in things with you, like your presentation material or your demonstration material. I keep saying, do not take it in. And people have just said, 
I need to take it in with me. So I've altered the prelude in a way that it's all right to take things in with you. And everything you hear about the prelude from now on is perfect. And what I'm doing is giving you a preface. And that is for you to say something like this, if you've brought in your demonstration or presentation material. And that's, you know, my company likes me to give a presentation as soon as I can so I can wow the prospect. But I'm not sure yet that that's really something that you need because I don't have enough information. And then you're right back into the prelude. I'll leave it at that. Listen to this next segment about the prelude. And remember that I've now given you the freedom in this system to actually bring in your presentation material or your demonstration material. Just put it to the side and refer to it, you know. That's all you need to do. Enjoy the next segment. Here is the prelude once again. And remember, every question you ask is designed to uncover a no, not create one. Mr. Prospect, before we start our conversation, please understand that I'm not sure whether or not you have a need for what I provide because I don't have enough information yet. So, if it's okay, I'd like to ask you a few questions, and you might have some for me, and based on my experience, within a few minutes, we'll know whether or not there's a reason for us to move forward. Is that an okay way to start? Contained in the prelude are at least three mutually beneficial agreements. Did you identify them? First, you have an agreement to ask each other some questions. You both have the freedom to decide if the conversation proceeds past the few minute mark, and you have an agreement to begin the communication in this agreed upon fashion. By offering these choices to the prospect, we are providing them with implied control as covered in episode six. You want your prospect to be sitting comfortably in the driver's seat. In return, you get the opportunity to proceed with the communication with your set of rules in place. Now it's time to follow the prelude with another request for an agreement. And if anywhere in our conversation, Mr. Prospect, you come to the conclusion that my product or service is not for you, how comfortable will you be telling me that? Prospects love this. It buys them an opportunity to get off the hook, so to speak but wait for their answer. After they say it will be comfortable to say no if called for, thank them, and then move to your next agreement. Great. Also, I'd really like to avoid ending our conversation with you saying maybe or I want to think about it. I bring this up because in a lot of cases, people will say maybe or I want to think about it as a polite substitute for what? Wait for your answer. Remember, when you say it, it's selling. When they say it, it's true. So wait for their answer. They will invariably say no. Acknowledge their honesty and assure them. It's fine if you really need to think about it or you need more information before we proceed, but my request is that you avoid using maybe or I want to think about it as a substitute for no. Okay? Once again, they will probably agree. But if at any point you start to sense the prospect becoming adversarial or ornery with your MBAs, you get to ask them another type of question. You get to ask them the type of question you've always wanted to ask prospects, but you thought it might be inappropriate, such as, Mr. Prospect, you seem less than interested in proceeding in the way I'm suggesting. Is that a reasonable observation? If they say yes, ask them how they would like to proceed. If their answer is unacceptable, you already have the choice of terminating the call and avoiding a problem client. Those who use the yes formula on a regular basis find that there's an additional perk. You can say or ask any question you want as long as you have a smile on your face 
and ask from a standpoint of curiosity. But in return, you must avoid the tendency to make their responses and actions mean anything about you. It's about your communication. Remember, the meaning of your communication is the response that you get. Now, here's something you heard me say a few episodes ago. And I know it's harsh, but your prospects really don't care about you. They don't care about your product or your service. They don't care what your product or service does or how it does it. All a prospect cares about is what you or your product or service can do for them. Does your product solve their problem? Stay curious. Stay neutral. It may be hard at first. However, this is one of the key stress reducers in this entire system. Stay curious. You can remember to do this by remembering the ingredient in the yes formula. Can. Curious, authentic, and neutral. Now you can add that other A in there about being apart from the problem. I find that very helpful. Just a reminder, the accompanying digital action guide for the entire Close the Deal Without Selling podcast is now available at sellandmarketbetter.com. And remember to use the episode coupon code that you'll find in your show notes. If they've agreed to the mutually beneficial agreements regarding maybes and I want to think about it, you can move to the next section, which is the you section. And this is where you uncover the issues that your prospect is facing, the issues that made them interested in exploring your possible solutions in the first place. Once again, Mr. Prospect, I'm not sure whether or not you have the type of issues our product addresses, but if it turns out that you do, and you're going to be the judge of that, once again, this gives them implied control, and you're going to be the judge of that, we're going to have to discuss the budget for this project. If we get to that point in the conversation, how willing are you to share what kind of dollars you have set aside for this? You know, I'm talking ballpark figures. They'll either respond, sure, or we'll see, or no. Either way, you'll be getting the information you need to decide whether to move forward in the communications process. And it's been my experience that they usually say yes, even if that's not their immediate intention. Wait until later to discuss the money issues. You're just setting up the fact that if they believe you can help them with their problem, the topic of paying for that solution is going to come up. Next, we move to the step that helps us make sure that we're meeting with someone that can do more than just say no. So, Mr. Prospect, if it turns out that we get far enough in the process to move forward, is there anyone else besides yourself that would be involved in the decision? If they say yes, request that those people be present in the meeting. If those additional decision makers can't be present, either reschedule or face the fact that you may have to repeat the process at a later date. Another way to gauge a non-decision maker's interest is set up this agreement. Uh, let's agree that at the end of our conversation, you'll tell me if it were up to you whether you would work with us or not. The last thing you want is someone who is not enrolled in your solution telling the higher-ups what that solution is. You'll hardly ever make a sale in those conditions. If they say they are the one that can make the decision and they can make it on their own, I suggest you verify that information. You can ask, so no spouse, significant other, business partner, or accountant will be involved in the decision to move ahead? Be sure to make this industry specific. For a banker, you might ask about a board or an underwriter or a committee that oversees decisions. Know the industry hierarchy. But if they still say, nobody else, I can make the decision myself, 
move on and file their answer away for later reference. And finally, request that they share the reason for their decision. This is part of the K section of QUIC and that K stands for knowledge. K is the final section of QUIC before you get into your sales interview. Tell them, you know, I'm always curious about someone's motives and reasons for buying and would really appreciate hearing your thoughts. In this exercise, the prospect has responded positively to the MBAs in a way that will have me begin the qualifying interview. Last but not least, you ask the prospect if they would like to speak or would they prefer that you go first. If they choose to go first, let them speak. If they ask you to go first, it's time for your first question. This first question is, I'm curious, when you decided to take the time to talk to me, what were you hoping I might be able to do for you? Rather than launch into a traditional presentation, ask a well-formed, open-ended question and put the ball back in their court. Those of you who are tennis players know that consistently hitting the ball over the net is the hardest part of that sport. Since it's so hard, why not shift that responsibility to the person on the other side of the net? In other words, keep the ball in the other person's court. Believe it or not, we just went through an entire overview of Q. All of the agreements and questions that were set up are part of the Q in Quick. The Q actually lays out all of the components in a neat package. You'll see this more clearly in a little while. Like the public speaking model, you've just finished telling the prospect what they can expect in the remainder of the process. Now, you haven't actually completed the process, you've only just started. And as long as it might have seemed, all of those steps that we went through take no more than 90 seconds to maybe five minutes on the outside. Now, I'm going to go through the process and you're going to act as the dream prospect and answer all of my questions without any resistance, okay? It would probably sound something like this. Remember, if at any time they don't respond in a way that makes you comfortable enough to move forward, now is the time to respectfully withdraw. But if you're comfortable moving forward, it's time for the next step of the system, which is you uncover their problem. Remember that you told the prospect that they might have issues that your product or service could address. This is where you uncover those issues, or as we're going to refer to them, the prospect's problems. All right, that's enough for this episode. We've covered quite a bit, and there is still a bunch left to go over when it comes to the quick system. In the next episode, we'll be starting with the you portion of quick, uncovering the problem. So until then, this is Ike Krieger. See you next time.